yeah. we know about all the problems and contradictions in the region but which were based on the reality. Dear colleagues, I must note that such an honest and frank approach of Russia has been recently used as a pretext to accuse it of its growing ambitions, as if those who say it have no ambitions at all. However, it's not about Russia's ambitions, dear colleagues, but about the recognition of the fact that we can no longer tolerate the current state of affairs in the world. What we actually propose is to be guided by common values and common interests rather than ambitions. On the basis of international law, we must join efforts to address the problems that all of us are facing and create a genuinely broad international coalition against terrorism. Similar to the anti-Hitler coalition, it could unite a broad range of forces that are resolutely resisting those who just like the Nazis so evil and hatred of humankind. And naturally, the Muslim countries are to play a key role in the coalition, even more so because the Islamic State does not only pose a direct threat to them, but also desecrates one of the greatest world religions by its bloody crimes. The ideologists of militants make a mockery of Islam and pervert its true humanistic values. I would like to address Muslim spiritual leaders as well. Your authority and your guidance are of great importance right now. It is essential to prevent people recruited by militants from making hasty decisions and those who have already been deceived and who, due to various circumstances, found themselves among terrorists, need help in finding a way back to normal life, laying down arms and putting an end to fratricide. Russia will shortly convene, as the current president of the Security Council, a ministerial meeting to carry out a comprehensive analysis of threats in the Middle East. First of all, we propose discussing whether it is possible to agree on a resolution aimed at coordinating the actions of all the forces that confront the Islamic State and other terrorist organizations. Once again, this coordination should be based on the principles of the UN Charter. We hope that the international community will be able to develop a comprehensive strategy of political stabilization as well as social and economic recovery of the Middle East. Then, dear friends, there would be no need for new refugee camps. Today, the flow of people who were forced to leave their homeland has literally engulfed first neighboring countries and then Europe itself. There are hundreds of thousands of them now and there might be millions before long. In fact, it is a new, great and tragic migration of peoples. And it is a harsh lesson for all of us, including Europe. I would like to stress Refugees undoubtedly need our compassionate support. However, the only way to solve this problem at a fundamental level is to restore the statehood where it has been destroyed, to strengthen the government institutions where they still exist or are being re-established, to provide comprehensive assistance of military, economic and material nature to countries in a difficult situation, and Certainly to those people who, despite all the ordeals, will not abandon their homes. Naturally, any assistance to sovereign states can and must be offered rather than imposed exclusively and solely in accordance with the UN Charter. In other words, everything in this field that is being done or will be done pursuant to the norms of international law must be supported by our organization. Everything that contravenes the UN Charter must be rejected. Above all, I believe it is of the utmost importance to help restore government's institutions in Libya, support the new government of Iraq, and provide comprehensive assistance to the legitimate government of Syria. Dear colleagues, ensuring peace and regional and global stability remains the key objective of the international community with the UN at its helm. We believe this means creating a space of equal and indivisible security, which is not for the select few, but for everyone. Yes, it is a challenging, complicated and time-consuming task, but there is simply no other alternative. However, the block thinking of the times of the Cold War and the desire to explore new geopolitical areas is still present among some of our colleagues. First, the 
continue their policy of expanding NATO, what for if the Warsaw Bloc stopped its existence, the Soviet, war, the Soviet Union had collapsed, and nevertheless, the NATO continues expanding as well as its military infrastructure, then they offered the poor Soviet countries a false choice, either to be with the West or with the East. Sooner or later, this logic of confrontation was bound to spark off a grave geopolitical crisis. This is exactly what happened in Ukraine, where the discontent of population with the current authorities was used and a military coup was orchestrated from outside that triggered a civil war as a result. We're confident that only through full and faithful implementation of the Minsk agreements of February 12, 2015, can we put an end to the bloodshed and find a way of, of the deadlock. Ukraine's territorial integrity cannot be ensured by threat of force and force of arms. What is needed is a genuine consideration for the interests and rights of the people in the Donbas region and respect for their choice. There is a need to coordinate with them as provided for by the Minsk agreements, the key elements of the country's political structure. These steps will guarantee that Ukraine will develop as a civilized state as an essential link in building a common space of security and economic cooperation both in Europe and in Eurasia. Ladies and gentlemen, I have mentioned this common space of economic cooperation on purpose. Not long ago, it seemed that in the economic sphere with its objective market laws, we would learn to live without dividing lines. We would build on transparent and jointly formulated rules, including the WTO principles stipulating the freedom of trade and investment and open competition. Nevertheless, today, unilateral sanctions circumventing the UN Charter have become almost commonplace in addition to pursuing political objectives. These sanctions serve as a means of eliminating competitors I would like to point out another sign of a growing economic selfishness. Some countries have chosen to create closed and exclusive economic associations, with the establishment being negotiated behind the scenes in secret from those countries' own citizens, the general public, business community, and from other countries. Other states whose interests may be affected are not informed of anything either. It seems that we are about to be faced with an accomplished fact that the rules of the game have been changed in favor of a narrow group of the privileged, with the WTO having no say. This could unbalance the trade system completely and disintegrate the global economic space. These issues affect the interests of all states and influence the future of the world economy as a whole. That is why we propose discussing them within the UN, WTO and G20. Contrary to the policy of exclusiveness, Russia proposes harmonizing regional economic projects. I refer to the so-called integration of integrations based on universal and transparent rules of international trade. As an example, I would like to cite our plans to interconnect the Eurasian Economic Union and China's initiative of the Silk Road Economic Belt. We still believe that harmonizing the integration processes within the Eurasian Economic Union and the European Union is highly promising. Ladies and gentlemen, the issues that affect the future of all people include the challenge of global climate change. It is in our interest to make the UN Climate Change Conference to be held in December in Paris a success. As part of our national contribution, we plan to reduce by 2030 the greenhouse gas emissions to 70-75% of the 1990 level. I suggest, however, we should take a wider view on this issue. Yes, we might diffuse the problem for a while by setting quotas on harmful emissions or by taking other measures that are nothing but tactical, but we will not solve it that way. We need a completely different approach. We have to focus on introducing fundamentally new technologies inspired by nature, which would not damage the environment, but would be in harmony with it. Also, they would allow us to restore the balance between the biosphere and technosphere upset by human activities. It is indeed a challenge of planetary scope, but I'm confident that humankind has intellectual potential to address it. We need to join our efforts. I refer first of all to the states that have
a solid research basis and that have made significant advances in fundamental science. We propose convening a special forum under the UN auspices for a com comprehensive consideration of the issues related to the depletion of natural resources, destruction of habitat and climate change. Russia would be ready to co-sponsor such a forum. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, it was on the 10th of January 1946 in London that the UN General Assembly gathered for its first session. Mr. Zuleta Angel, a Colombian diplomat and the chairman of the Preparatory Commission, opened the session by giving, I believe, a concise definition of the basic principles that the UN should follow in its activities, which are free will, defiance of scheming and trickery, and spirit of cooperation. Today, his words sound as a guidance for all of us. Russia believes in the huge potential of the United Nations, which should help us avoid a new global confrontation and engage in strategic cooperation. Together with other countries, we will consistently work towards strengthening the central coordinating role of the UN. I'm confident that by working together, we will make the world stable and safe, as well as provide conditions for the development of all states and nations. Thank you. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Russian Federation for the statement just made. May I request representatives to remain seated while we greet the President. 